If you enjoy the channel and our video content and would like to support us, you can do this in a couple of ways. You can sign up to our Patreon site which is a monthly subscription to one of our four tiers, each giving you something different from early access interviews up to exclusive unseen footage. There's also the option of a one-off donation via PayPal which allows you the option to donate an amount of your choice. Both options really help to keep this channel going and to continue putting out regular content for you good folk. So please take a look at aircurrentreview.tv forward slash donate and I thank you in advance. Thank you and enjoy. So we're here with Ian Black, and I'm sure most of our audience will already know Ian, but if you don't, he's a former Tornado F3 pilot, and he's here to join us today to share um, a story from Flying the Mighty Finn for another episode of Tornado Tales. So Ian, I'm going to put it over to you. Good evening. Well, um, I did wonder whether you should you know, wear your flying suit or something, and <laughs> I, have, I have, as I've done these interviews with you, and I've become more... Uh, accustomed to them wondered whether you know you should actually sort of set yourself in a bit of an environment but um i've been out all day doing stuff and i haven't really so i've, I've put some models behind me of the airplanes that i've flown perfect and uh, trying to look myself reasonably presentable um and i uh, just had a quick chat with mike and talking about the tornado f3 that i flew uh, i flew the f2 once uh, and then i flew the f3 after that and i was trying to pick um out of the five years and 12 and hours i flew trying to pick um not just one story perhaps, but maybe an event or uh, an, a period in flying the tornado that would have, you know, interest people. Um, and I guess sort of going back through my logbook as I did this morning, uh, the, the big sort of changeover was um, there was a very different shift in emphasis of what we did between um, the Tornado F3 coming into service, which was a little bit um, lacklustre to say the least. Uh, and, and the fall of the, the Berlin Wall, the end of the Cold War, everything sort of took on this sort of same way, same day type feeling. And although the type of flying that we were doing became far more complex and far more operational, as the sort of the, the threat from the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact diminished, uh, there didn't seem to be as much of a purpose into what we were doing. Yet the RAF had committed to having two squadrons of F3s at Coningsby, three at Leeming, and two at Lucas. So that that was cast in stone, and that was going to happen. So there was no way they were going to change that at that time. So we um, we, we started off with the F3 in uh, Leeming, and that had two hardened shelter squadrons and one hangered squadron. So we had 11, 23, and 25. And I got posted initially to 23 squadron from the Lightning, and I left the Lightning to join the Tornado F3 as it then was OCU, and it was a bit like the Phantom OCU. So they, you know, they had 26 aeroplanes sat out on the line, lettered A to Z. Uh, you know, they almost ran out of letters on the alphabet. But it was it was a sausage machine, but it was a very very slow sausage machine. And, you know, one of my, I guess, big gripes about the RAF of that period was how um, how ineffective OCUs were. And, you know, I'm not going to spend the, uh, the hour talking about that or half an hour talking about it. But, you know, you had an awful lot of aeroplanes, had an awful lot of ground crew, an awful lot of students. And at the end of the course, you know, you only produced maybe 10 crews every six months or so. It was really slow. And it was with the Phantom and I gather it still is with the, the Typhoon and certainly pilot training. Um, so I know that's something of a bit of a, <clears throat> a bugbear to me that it, it wasn't a very, you know, you'd sit for three or four days and then fly a trip. And then when you're learning to fly an aeroplane, you want to be flying twice a day every day. So it was a very, very slow, laborious process. And the aeroplane was reasonably serviceable, but, you know, if the radar didn't work, then that mission was canned. So you had to then go back and do it again. And there was lots of other stuff going on in between, so it, it wasn't a great um, a great course to do. But in the end, we got posted to 23 squadron. That we were the nucleus of 23 squadron, as it were. And again, that wasn't a particularly uh, dynamic squadron. We moved into a brand new house site, so you know the initial start of it was tedious. You know, we were doing things like building coffee bars and parts and <laughs> you know, really, really boring stuff. And 
one of the sort of uh, things which was very disappointing was we only had the aircraft, I don't know, three or four months, and already they were talking about using too much fatigue and worrying about the amount of fatigue we used. Mm. So our aircraft that we got were, I think they were called Z-list uh, radars, um, and they were delivered all new from the factory. For some reason, I don't think I ever went and got a brand new one, although we did go and have a, a vi visit to the factory, but they didn't have auto wing sweep, um, they didn't have auto maneuver flap, and they were very, very basic. So they had Z-list radar, they had an RHWR that sort of worked, but they had no other defensive aids. And we sort of worked up to um, getting operational on the squadron, which we did in sort of four or five months. And I was out in Cyprus in the May, having joined in the February, I think. And I got a, a phone call to say, did I want to go to 25 Squadron, which was then forming on the next HAS site um, with a guy called Mick Martin, who was a really nice guy and a very, very sharp operator. And did they want me to go there to um, just have some experience? And, you know, I only had nine months experience on the tornado by then, and I jumped at the chance. So I said, yes. So I didn't do very long in 23. I went to 25, and I guess I'd been there. Uh, I would have to look at my log, but, but it hadn't been there that long. And again, once, it, you know, as I said, we set, sort of got into this routine of going to fire a missile, going to Cyprus, doing exercises and, and stuff like that. And so looking at my logbook in August 1990, uh, I'd just come back from Larbuk doing an exercise called Mallet Blow, and I must have then gone to Alcanbury to um, provide a static for an air show. We were there yeah. the weekend, and life was pretty calm, to be honest. I remember my backseater and I, you know, thinking of things to do on the Saturday night, it must have been on the Friday night, we went to the Bay Cinema and we watched, watched the hunt for Red October. We were, you know, this is, you know, the Cold War and this is how it's going to be in the Cold War, sort of getting a bit, you know, warm now and nothing's going to happen. And then there was an actually uh, an announcement, you know, in the middle of the thing, a bit like the 1940s Pathé News, that um, Iraq had invaded Kuwait. Mm. Oh, hmm. oh, well, that won't affect us too much, you know, not our problem. But literally by the end of the film, um, rumours were starting to go around that the RAF were going to get involved and um, things were going to change, definitely. Mm -hmm. So the RAF deployed 29 and Fire Squad, who were in rotation at Cyprus at the time. And we were told that the Leeming Wing would then deploy to um, Dharan to replace 29 and Fire Squad. So on the Monday morning, you know, the, the usual sort of, oh, let's think of something to do and fly back and all that sort of stuff. We literally got airborne and uh, flew back in a straight line. And I remember um, the weather at Leeming, even for an August, was particularly bad. And the cloud base was below 200 feet where we shouldn't normally have got in. But they wanted us back so desperately that I remember getting to 200 feet and not seeing the lights and thinking, well, I'll just make up my own minima now and go down to 150, 100 feet. And I did see the lights and landed. And as soon as we landed, it was, you know, unbelievable to, to set the scene it was a sleepy little three squadron big airfield that all of a sudden overnight had gone on a war footing. Yeah. And, you know, before when you went to stores and asked for a new pair of gloves and the guys said, no, there aren't any in, you've got to bring two pairs in to get one, all that sort of stuff, that went out the window. And within 24 hours, whatever you wanted, you got. And if you asked for something, it was given to you. Mm -hmm. and so... We, we had lots of briefings to start with, and there were lots of meetings that didn't involve <coughs> uh, the junior pilots and navigators. But at senior levels, there were lots of meetings, and it was pretty clear that there would be a, a wing deployment from the, the Leeming wing, and that would involve 11, 23, and 25 squadron. And I tried to remember how many crews from each, and I think, I think it might have been about 10 crews from each squadron. Mm. Pretty much 75% of each squadron were going to go and deploy to Leeming. So we all moved out of 25 squadron, the 10 crews that were chosen. And I, I was trying to think as well, you know, were you chosen because you were the world's best fighter pilot, the best <laughs> fighter navigator? And I, I don't think you were. Really. I think it was more a case of, you know, who wasn't on leave, who wasn't going on leave, whose wife wasn't having a baby, um, who was a weapons instructor, um, who had experience on type, you know, and it sort of naturally fell down to finding 10 crews from each. And we then became constituted crews as well. So my backseater stayed as my backseater for the whole of the next three or four months. 
So we moved across to 11 Squadron and said goodbye to 25 Squadron, uh, as did 23 and 11, and formed the sort of the leaming wing. And then there was a huge amount of shuffling of airframes because all of a sudden the RAF decided that, you know, they were going to deploy the Tornado F3, of which they're going to deploy maybe 20, 25 maybe, 20, around about 20, 25 aircraft to the Gulf. And that was going to cause them a massive logistical problem because it wasn't, um, and this was one of their failings, was they couldn't just pick 11 and 25 squadron and send those because all the aircraft were different standards. So some had Z-list radars, some had W or Y-list radars. Um, some were due for major servicing, some weren't due for major servicing. And so the engineers had a, had a huge task of trying to pick 25 aircraft that they knew they could deploy in August, mm. either major service until December or January. So that was the, the rationale behind it. And at the same time, all the... Um, I think they were called CTTO, which was Central Trials and Tactics Organization. They already had a huge wish list for the Tornado F3 of bolt-on goodies that they wanted that they were never going to get. And they were items that had they asked for in 1990, they'd have got them by the time they went out of service. All of a sudden, all those things they wanted became money no object. Mm. And things like, um, well, Chaff and Flares was the big one and um, AIM-9 Mike was another, and also radar absorbent um, paint on the aircraft. So they all the things that they wanted to put onto the aircraft were embodied into the aircraft in double quick time. Um, the biggest things really were the Chapman flares, which should have been on the airplane from day one. And so they were put onto the back of the engine doors that went on the back of the airframe. And of course, you know, being an air defense squadron, we never operated with live weapons, and chaff and flares were classed as being as live weapons. So all of a sudden now, we then had to train the ground crew and the ground crew had to train us that you know, when you approach the aircraft, there were danger aircraft arms signed and little flags on there. You know, a flare going off on the pan could have been a, a disaster. So we, we've had to tune to now flying with live, live weapons. The sky flash that we had was the super temp sky flash, and I don't remember exactly what that meant but it was the latest standard and so that was fine one thing that we didn't do which we should have done is that we should have started training with four dummy missiles on and four winders on and maybe tanks on mm. because all we ever did was fly in the clean configuration the f3 and the f3 was actually pretty good in the clean configuration but once we got to daran and it became 40 degrees c and it was it wasn't, it wasn't so it was a sea level so that wasn't an issue of altitude the airplane was a completely different airplane. So we didn't really, you know, uh, do ourselves any favors with that. Um, one of the things which the Tornado F3, um, it became clear that it wasn't good at was that the radar cross section was massive. It was obviously pre anything to do with stealth. And when you stuck four Skyflash underneath, which had what well, eight fins on each missile, times four, these fins were like great big sharks underneath the aircraft and the sidewinders and the tanks. All of a sudden, from the frontal area, the cross-section was massive. Some bright spark had the idea that they would paint the leading edge of the wings with what was known as radar absorbent paint or RAM, radar absorbent material. It was like um, a sort of non-slip sticky surface on your stairs. And they daubed that on the leading edge of the wings. If you see pictures of the F3, um, what they did was they... Uh, they got the the leading edge of the wing and they put this ram paint on there and they put it up the, the fin as well. I don't think they put it on the, the tailplane. And <laughs> then, then somebody had another great idea that because of the, the cross section of the aeroplane, that what they would do is put tiles, radar absorbent tiles down the intake and they would glue the... So at night when we'd finished flying, at, you know, 8 o'clock at night, whenever it was, the engineers would go down the intakes and glue these sort of floor tiles you know, absorbent tiles onto the intake of the aeroplane. Now, <laughs> they were supposed to cure overnight with the glue, but after a couple came off and got ingested down the engines, I think mm -hmm. they thought it was a pretty silly idea. So so we gave that idea up. And, you know, the, the radar absorbent paint was a pretty um, crazy idea as well. There was something in the aeroplane um, called the special facility switch, I seem to remember. And <laughs> that was so super secret 
that nobody on the squad, even the weapons instructors, didn't know, and there was a brown envelope. And there was a big joke at the time that it was in the back seat, and there was um, the the radar, I remember, was frequency agile, and you could change the frequency of the radar. And nobody knew what this switch did, but it was a wartime only, and we were told that if you go to war, we'll tell you what it does, and you'll all find out then, and the brown envelope be opened. And we're all joking, so you, you, know, you, turn the, you put the switch on, and the F3 becomes an F15 or something. <laughs> but I think actually what it was, it just increased the power of the transmitter or something. It was something to do with the ECM feature of the, the radar, but it, it wasn't that great a secret. I can remember that. So we got uh, Chef and Flares, we got AIM-9 Mike, which was a um, an improvement to the AIM-9 Lima, and that was on a, fre- a flare ejection mode. So the AIM-9 Lima, when it saw a, um, a flare come out, it would go for the brightest source, and it would just home for the flare. The AIM-9 Mike had a system where it looked at the, the heat source, and if a flare came out that was hotter, it would then look at it and say, oh, that's hotter, and then reject that, and then flick back to the... The, the, the primary heat source so it did have like a flare ejection capability and i've read recently that actually it didn't it didn't do an awful lot of good and we're a bit hoodwinked into getting the aim line mic but anyway we got the aim line mic and then we got have quick in the aircraft which again <clears throat> we hadn't used before and that was a, a secure radio and it's a bit like having if you're uh, not familiar with it people listening to it it's quite a hard thing to explain but it's as if you're having a conversation with somebody saying um, the big red fox jumps over the bridge and then the, the phrase of the big red fox jumps over the bridge is all um, pixelated. So it's like, duh, 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 duh. and then the other person's radio is tuned to the same frequency effectively that you are. So that duh, 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 becomes the big red fox jumps over the bridge mm-hmm. and everybody is tuned to the same have quick frequency. And that's how I remember it works. So, the way you worked it was you sent a thing called a Mickey, which was a tone, and you did this all together. So you synced all your radios together, and you sat on the pan, and the leader would say, sending a Mickey in five, four, three, two, one, and you'd press one, and you'd send the Mickey, and you'd go beep like that, and then you'd all be synced to it. Mm. And if you were all synced to it, then you could effectively have a decoded or a coded radio frequency. And that's something the RAF didn't have or never had. Um, but the Americans insisted that if we were going to operate in the Gulf, then we had to have half quick radio. So that all got Im- implemented. And I seem to recall as well that on the half quick was maybe not the half quick, but on the IFF, on the interrogation friend or foe, that changed every 30 minutes. And they gave us some little Seco um, digital watches without a strap on. We had to put that into our earpiece and our headset. In our, head, in our bone domes, and every 30 minutes it go beep, 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 and that was to remind us to change the, the score code. Uh, other things that we got, we got, um, but I, I looked at a photograph of myself in the Gulf, um, one of my original selfies, and it, it didn't seem to be there, but we, I seem to remember we had uh, visors on our bone domes that were gold-plated for um, laser um, wow. denial. So if somebody pointed a laser at you, you had this gold visor that reflected or deflected the laser. But I looked at my bone dome of a picture I took of myself and I didn't seem to have a gold plated visor. So maybe they ran out of money on that one. <laughs> yeah, Ian, to wrap up, yeah, because obviously you're an author and everyone knows you as that as well. So are you still online? Are you still doing books there currently? Yeah, so what's coming up for yourself? Yeah, I still do books. I did one in the Lightning last year called the Lightning Manual which has been really successful, and uh, that's sort of gone from a new um, approach to writing books. So there's a bit more uh, memorabilia in there, a bit more writing, a couple of photographs I've done. Uh, I've got a new guy who scans my images who's absolutely brilliant. So my photographs, I'm now being able to go back through my negative collection, and he's producing uh, negative images, which are like Kodachrome, so that's really good. I'm working on a phantom book uh, called The Phantom Manual, which we spoke about before we started now, which is going to be a two-volume book, one on the operational side, which will cover uh, 892 Navy stuff, British phantoms, ground attack, air defense, F4Js, Falkland Islands, everything. So that's why that's in one full book. And then next year, I've got a book commissioned to do on the Transatlantic Air Race Harrier, which is something a bit different for me uh, and something I'm very excited about doing. Uh, And that'll probably lead on to a Harrier Manual, uh, like the Haynes manual did, because um, I know that when I start getting into that, the Harrier and everything to do with the Harrier, 
um, I want to do a book that covers only the um, needle nose, pointy nose harriers or the dolphin ones, not the, the GR5s. After that, I've probably got enough material just to do another lightning book, um, and then I want to start writing my biography books. So, and I've got a I've got a fictional novel I want to do at some stage. So yeah, I'm pretty busy at the moment. <laughs> Not half, uh, but yeah. uh, you're obviously online as well. Is it still uh, is it Firestreaks.com? Yeah, or? it's uh, www.firestreaksbooks.com. Uh, and as we spoke about before, I do try and uh, put stuff on Twitter. I don't put much on Facebook now and I don't put much on Instagram because I just don't really have the time. I know that there is a way you can post up on Instagram that goes on the Facebook and Twitter and all that sort of stuff and link it all together. But I, as we, as we spoke, you know, I'd rather if I put something on there about flying the phantom and somebody asks me a question, I can actually have the time to answer it and say, yeah, that's probably right. Or that's wrong. Or whatever. Yeah. I think that's a good way of thinking. And I'll link uh, Ian's website in the description below as, uh, as well as his Twitter and you can go and give him a follow and uh, get his books uh so yeah ian thank you very much for coming on the show it's always a pleasure to have you on and hopefully we can get you on again because you're a wealth of stories and it's uh, i could i could poke you for ages and ask you this that and the other but uh, thank you for doing this well you're you're a great interviewer michael and i love talking to you and um you know you're always very enthusiastic and i'm very grateful to uh, all the exposure you give me so anybody that listens to this stuff if they want to go onto twitter and ask me a question or if they if they would rather have a book done this way or that way, you know, I'm not too modest. I'm, I'm quite happy to take um, criticism or comments or advice from anybody, really. Brilliant. Well, cheers and thank you very much again, Ian. Pleasure. Good to talk to you, Mike.